Hello, my name is Scott Silsby, and welcome to Color is Not Black and White. This is Color Management, Part 1. In this presentation, we're going to cover a couple of objectives. First of all, we're going to look at the critical components defining digital workflow, specifically with color management. Secondarily, we're going to look at the capabilities of a device, the capabilities of substrate, and the ink, and we're going to look at the requirements of customers and try to match those. If we define these objectives, there's less risk and a higher rate of success in the environment. There's going to be two parts to this presentation. Part one has two sections. We're going to define the playing field and look at the variables in a workflow. Secondarily, we're going to get the solution right the first time, or hopefully. And we're going to look at acceptance and define acceptance and realize that once they accept it, that is success. So first of all, defining the playing field. What does this mean? Workflow can be defined by combining all of the variables. Once we understand what printer we're going to use, and what paper we're going to print on, and what ink we're going to use in the environment, then we need to define what target we're going to try to hit. We need to have some quantitative value that defines whether or not the solution is correct or not. Then we've got to look at how much tolerance is allowed to stray away from that target and still be within a qualified target. Customers also vary. They vary in the desire of what they want to be printed and what they say is acceptable target and tolerance. So let's look at these individually. Let's look at the printer and the ink. OSE has several printing devices, the Jetstream, the ColorStream, the ColorStream that's inkjet, the ColorStream that's toner. In all of these devices and in all the other devices in the industry, whether it's offset, toner, dye, or pigment ink jet, the base colors of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black vary. As you can see on screen, in 100% color of each one of these base colors, they are not the same. Even black varies slightly. As we begin to, to define the environment, we have to understand what the customer wants. If they have a color, that requires one of these base colors to be spot on according to some specification, we may or may not be able to fit into that environment. The paper itself or the substrate we print on has characteristics as well that need to be kept in mind, especially in the inkjet environment. Yes, there is bond, offset, treated, coated, gloss, matte, etc papers, but what does that mean in this inkjet environment? A coated paper in inkjet doesn't mean the same thing as coated paper in the offset environment. A coated paper in inkjet has some kind of a treatment on the surface and sometimes in the paper to help hold that ink, to help keep that ink from absorbing too far or spreading too far. If it's treated properly, it's going to hold the dot in a specific area and it's going to allow another dot to lie next to it or blend to it depending upon how the characteristics are designed. All of this design goes into how much color is available in that paper with that paper with the ink and printer combination. But before we start going into a customer environment and giving suggestions, we should understand what the customer needs. We understand their goals. We need to speak their language. All of this adds up to more of a satisfied customer in the end. What do I mean by understanding their environment? Well, first of all, is communicate. If we don't communicate clearly and use the right terms in the customer environment, in this industry, we will be labeled non-credible. We want to be credible. We under want to understand the terms, the language, the jargon, etc. So there's a lot of terms you see on screen that you may or may not know the definitions of. I'd recommend if you do not know the definitions of most of these, that you begin to look them up online and study what they mean. 
many of these targets are critical. Many of these terms are critical to developing a good workflow. So there's a lot of challenges we have when we migrate from offset or from transactional. Sometimes we're migrating from digital black and white to digital color. Sometimes we're migrating from analog color to digital color, etc. Some of these differences are the nuances that define workflow, like the screening algorithms. Conventional or AM screening with toner technologies or offset might look different than frequency modulation or stochastic screening in our inkjet technologies. There are things in color matching that have to be considered. Some offset inks may reach colors that our inkjet inks cannot reach, depending upon the papers you print on. This goes into the definition of a workflow as we start doing spot color matching, even image color matching. If we do not convert with some kind of a control, then our results will be mixed. So what are these targets I'm talking about? What does the industry say about printing targets? First of all, what does it mean to be have a quality print? Does it mean that you have the largest color gamut? Or does it mean your edge effect is the best for barcodes, text, etc.? Or does it mean that we have a color gradient from a highlight area with very little color to a mid-tone area with some color and to a shadow area with a lot of color and it's very smooth without banding or graininess? Well, in fact, all of that defines color quality. So what targets can we use? What do we define? And what is acceptable? See, all of this has to be defined in the environment with your customer. And organizations also help to define tolerances, like the Printing Industries of America, the International Standards Organization, the IDE Alliance, European organizations like FAGRA. All of these organizations give recommendations. ISO, G7, Grackle, all of these terms can create some confusion. In fact, the International Standards Organization has defined process printing standards in the 12647, but it specifically talks to offset industry, web, newspaper, sheet-fed, offset, not digital. You might hear about standards, specifications, and guidelines and not know the differences between them. The International Standards Organization is the organization that produces standards. Specifications are delivered by organizations like IDE Alliance. They made the specifications for Grackle, Swap, etc., and these are nothing more than defining a paper, an ink, and a device, and the colors available with that combination. Guidelines like G7 is another one of those things to look at. G7 is one of those things you hear about in the industry. It's nothing more than a methodology. And this methodology targets a gray balance. And the gray balance I'm talking about is a combination of cyan, magenta, and yellow, and a balanced amount of that reaching what the black would look like in that same percentage, or a gray balance. This is what the G7 methodology will do for us. So what are these targets in our digital industry? They don't exist. There are no industry targets for digital standards. There are no targets defined. There are no tolerances defined. And there is no organization that controls these tolerances at this time. Now ISO 12647 is attempting to try to make some digital standards, but we're not there yet. It's not complete, and it hasn't been provided yet. So they do not exist. So some of these targets are left up to the vendors to state what the target should be and the tolerance should be. So as you can imagine, not all vendors agree. So this can create some problems when looking at solutions and trying to wedge ourselves against a competitor's claims for target and tolerance. I'd rather be accurate and understand what these things mean and deliver accuracy and truth to the customer. The goal we have is to get it right the first time. 
If we get it right the first time, the customer isn't going to come back to us. They're not going to complain to us. We're going to move forward with a good solution. Let's look at what this means, though. In order to define a target, we have to define that target. In the example on screen, you see a transactional document with a blue background. If this is all the customer wants to print in color, it's a fairly simple color match, isn't it? Generally, a, either a four-color blend or a spot color on that page with variable data put on it. If that's the customer solution and it's defined up front and the colors are defined, then now it's a discussion of which paper and which ink on what device can reach that color blue on that document. Some papers will not be able to reach that saturated blue, especially in the inkjet industry. Some four-color mixes can't reach certain spot color definitions. It's out of gamut. So once we define the colors, especially in a spot color environment we're trying to match, and we define with the customer how close they have to be, by the way, there is no perfection in color printing. There's always a tolerance defined. And the offset graphic arts industry says a five delta E variance is still within tolerance. You and your customer have to decide whether or not that's acceptable in their environment. But without discussing it, without defining it, we're leaving it up to a guess. So let's look at the purpose of these solutions and whether or not it's going to be a color target, a content target, or a combination that in reality could be called a contract if you hit both of those targets. So the color direction we're marching in, is it a Pantone matching color we're trying to reach? Is there a brand identity color? Is it this nebulous term called pleasing color? Are we replacing offset pre-printed shells or offset printed material? Are we migrating from transactional black and white and trying to add color to a document? You know, if we define these things and define what the customer is trying to come from and move to, not only in what they're trying to do, but what colors they're trying to hit, then we can begin to develop a workflow. Because from those components, we can define a target. And then we can begin to discuss the tolerance with that customer. And again, there is not going to be any perfection in color matching in this industry. There is none anywhere in this industry. There's always going to be a tolerance assigned to a process. Another direction is content. This is pretty easily understood. This is something OSE has done for many decades. We match the characters, barcodes, variable data, etc., on the paper somewhere, sometimes into a pre-printed shell. So the color isn't critical in this environment. Many times the third-party products are for the variable data whether it's Prisma Production or another customized solution. But even there, you know, the target is pretty well defined. The character has to be within a certain field. It has to be a variable field with a certain amount of variable data, and it has to be accurately represented. Very little room for tolerance in that kind of definition. So in a content, I can see where your tolerance would be zero variance. You'd have to have exact, perfect content. But if we combine content and color and put that into some kind of a contract, maybe if it's a plan of approach or some kind of a production document, then we can turn that into a contract. Mr. Customer, if we reach this color and we stay within these tolerances and we hit that target for content, will you sign the bottom line? So this is helpful when developing workflow in a customer environment. When it's time to deliver either a print sample or the finished product to a customer, we need to understand what the approval criteria should be, and we need to help the customer with understanding what the variances are. If we use a predefined criteria for approval, a procedure, a process, and a target, and we measure with that consistent procedure and repeat it and maintain that process, then we will be consistent and be able to hit that again and again and again. There are workflow solutions that are based upon best guess. And yes, there are times where you will hit that target, but not consistently. So the goal here is to have the customer accept the output. 
Let's look at what the industry says about customers, color, and color management. In December of 2011, I had the opportunity to attend the Printing Industries of America conference in Phoenix. They had sessions delivering information on this exact subject. Here's a screenshot of one of the presentations, Managing Realistic Color Expectations. So let's look at what the industry says about color matching. By the way, this industry represents digital, offset, wide format of all types. So customers and vendors were in this meeting from all over the industry. Managing expectations. So color is a color, isn't it? Isn't magenta the same all over the world? Well, in fact, no, it's not. Colors vary depending upon the type of ink or colorant you use, whether it's a monitor or defined in a specific type of color matching method. They vary. And managing those variances come into the workflow discussion. We have to define exactly what the customer wants to hit. Just because they say magenta doesn't mean their idea of magenta will be what we can provide. Even spot color matching is one of the hardest things to do in the four color process industry. Spot color matching is much harder to do than picture color matching because your eyes are focused on a single flat color. Pantone, or PMS, Pantone Matching System, Pantone sells a lot of ink, and they do a good job of it. They have a lot of colors that are outside of the CMYK gamut. If we use transformation tables to try to convert or simulate those spot colors in CMYK, sometimes we're disappointed with the results. The results are dependent upon the ink we're using, the device we're printing with, and the colorants we use in that environment. As you can see, some of these conversions, like the upper Pantone Orange 021, this is a famous color for CMYK matching, having a difficult time trying to match this. You can see in the bottom CMM LAB conversion that we can get kind of close, but we're nowhere near the upper left orange. It is out of gamut. You cannot reach that color on a four-color process CMYK device. So then the customer either has to settle for a close color, or as close as you can get, or they have to decide if they want to continue to use a spot color or custom tone. In the end, what we generally do is we have a swatch book, and we can capture and look at specific colors from the device we're using. And I'll show you an image of what the swatch books look like. As the slide builds, you can see that the sheets in this swatch book are a little bit like what a Pantone book would give you, different color variances. But this is the CMYK build differences. We have several different versions of these swatch books available in a PDF file. The customer would submit this through their normal workflow procedures. It would print on their device, on their paper, with their ink, so there is no question on whether or not they can hit those colors or not. They're seeing it exactly from their device. So they can push these out to their customer environment to help them decide what colors to define in their workflow. All of this comes into workflow discussion. Color transformations can be complicated. There are theoretical con uh, formulas that do not require profiles. In other words, we can bind, early bind color definitions for spot colors. We don't really need a profile for that. We can just define a certain value for a brand color or spot color. There is no conversion uh, formulas needed for that other than a defined early bound definition. And it's good for pure values, but it doesn't really work well for images. So already we're seeing that there are variances in whether or not we're going to print spot color or images in a workflow. So we can go to this standard color management discussion using ICC profiles. But an ICC profile isn't going to fix bad color. It will convert a bad color file into a bad output file very easily. And it's not going to make every bad file a good file. Some things it cannot 
repair. Another variable is where you view the color. When you deliver a print sample or when the customer looks at the output, if they're not looking at it under the right lighting environment, then they're not looking at it correctly, and they will make mistakes in judging color. By the way, there is really only one legal way to view color in North America. It's defined in the ISO 3664. It's a 2009 standard. It's 5,000 degrees Kelvin at 45 degree angle, and these are viewing booths, and these are required in the environment to view color correctly. One of the, a good reason and a good selling point to, to push customers into this type of viewing environment is that if they don't use this environment, they're not going to be viewing in the same environment we use here or maybe in the same environment their customers review in. So that is at least one constant we can have in this big pool of variables we're swimming in. When we start defining an approval process, we need to define whether or not it is subjective or objective. These are two terms that are interesting as we look at print. Let's define what they mean. What does subjective mean? Well, subjective means it exists in your mind. Your mind can actually influence what you view. Your mind is very strong when viewing color. It has its own opinions. So when you look at a specific color, you develop an opinion about it, whether you like it, whether you don't, whether it matches, and whether it doesn't. That's not really based upon anything other than the light available around you and the two colors you're looking at. There's no value you can pin on that other than it does or does not match. As we look at subjective approval, let's define what this means. So if subjective approval, the customer is going to base their decision on vision, so their vision, their eyes, their ability to see the lighting environment, their ability to understand color, and they're going to try to match it to a target. Usually it's a proof. It could be a press proof, it could be a proof from another proofing system, and they try to match that and look at it. Sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's a group of people. This is a subjective approval. There's no value assigned to it other than your vision. What does objective mean? Well, in an objective approval system, your personal feelings don't really come into play. Your eyesight doesn't really matter. What you're going to do is you're going to measure with an instrument. And usually it's a spectrophotometer or colorimeter. So the customer, and this usually works in spot color matching, this is the type of thing we would use, you define a target, like a PMS, you name it, color. We can measure that color and we can get an LAB value. So we can measure the color that's printed and get another LAB value. And we can use a formula, delta E, and it will tell you how far away from the original color the printed color was. Then it comes down to, well, how close do we have to be? Industry standard says 5 delta E is close enough. Does the customer think so? By the way, 1 delta E you can see with your eyes. You can see a visible difference. So that goes into play on how accurate we have to be in the environment you and your customer have to define how far they can be out. And if the tolerance is too tight, that discussion needs to come up and it needs to be uh, determined before the solution goes into place because we don't want them to be disappointed with too much variance. When is color approval necessary? I would say only when they're concerned about the printed material or always. How can you not consider color approval? How can you not measure? How can you not control this workflow and expect good results? And who does this approval? In the offset industry, generally an operator would do it. In the digital industry, it may be a production manager. It could be a sales representative or anybody else they define in the process. It doesn't really matter who they decide, define to do it, but it does need to be done as the product comes off the printer, off the press, 
and you compare it to the target, and you make an approval. If that's not done, and the complete production run is ran without an approval process, then there's a high risk of failure and not matching color. Now, where is this approval done? Really doesn't matter unless you're under the wrong lighting condition. So first of all, it has to be under the right lighting condition if you're using this subjective type of measurement. If you're using objective with a measurement colorimeter spectrophotometer, then at least the proper device and procedures need to be used. You have to use the right backing, not too much lighting around you to influence the measurements, etc. And most likely this is done at or near the printing device because you don't want to halt production. You want the machine to run, not be held up for a proof, hopefully. So the higher, and, uh, the, the higher rate of acceptance and the quicker proofs are approved, the higher rate of potential production we have. And why do we have this approval process? Why is it needed? Well, first of all, if you look at the images on screen, you can see they all vary. Some, you might say, look good. Some might look too light, too dark, too this or too that. Bottom line is, risks are very high without a defined approval process. And there will be failure without a defined approval process. You won't repeat the output, and we will not reach any accuracy, because we don't know what that accuracy is unless we define these variables. It's all just a best guess. Now it's time to deliver the sample or the printed output. Is it safe to walk up to a customer or to a customer's customer and just hand them the output? Or do we have to consider things like the lighting, the angle they're looking at it, whether or not the backing, what if it's a board conference table with very dark wood, does that influence the look and feel of the color? Yes, it does. So we have to consider all of these things when we're showing printed output. And then we need to look at how we look and compare these samples. Do you cast your eyes back and forth from one to the other, or do you stare intently at one area and say, that is very red, and yes, it's very red, and stare at it for two or three minutes? If you do that, you're fatiguing the cones in your eyes, and you will not, color, you will not judge color correctly. You're going to make mistakes. So there are things to control in these environments. And if we control these things with processes and procedures, then we're more likely to reach a known output and satisfy the customer. So what are the risks of not reaching these variables? Some of the risks are longer sales cycles or a failed sales cycle. The customer expectations might not be reached. And then if we don't reach their expectations, then what about our credibility as a company? Well, we've destroyed it or at least injured it. So the goal is let's try to reach these variables. Let's try to reach these needs and these workflow solutions and define them up front. If we do that, we have a higher rate of success. We have a shorter sales cycle. We place the machine and we finish the installation quicker. If we don't define these variables, there's a high risk of failure. If we don't have the customer understand that some substrates can hold more color than others, then they might be disappointed in the output. So if we do have a failure, and this is the section three preview for the next section of this color management, what we're going to look at in the next section is how to stay in the game. We'll call a timeout and we'll regroup. We'll decide what needs to be addressed. We'll start looking at some of the failure points. Ideally, we never want to fail. Realistically, we know we will from time to time. As we move forward, we'll see how we can recover, possibly recover from failure, how we can come back and readdress some of these issues. We're also going to look at managing this disappointment because once we fail, we've disappointed the customer. And so we need to look at these things like expectations. We need to look at 
whether or not the expectations were defined. We need to look at more of what the industry says about this and back it up with fact, not with just a vendor splash page, but with an industry standard specification or methodology. This holds more credibility across the industry. Disappointment can be defined as an expectation divided by reality. So if your reality is much bigger than your expectation, or your expectation is much bigger than your reality, you might not match what you want. So let's look at these variables as we move forward and define them throughout the process. So in this section, we looked at defining the playing field. And to define the playing field, that requires you to decide which printer, which substrate, which ink, and the type of work we're going to try to target. Not only the type of work, but how that work is formatted, what we have to do to that data in order to represent it in a way the customer wants. If we do that in a proper way, we're going to have success. If we don't define these things up front, we're likely to fail. Now, to get the solution right the first time requires upfront work, not just a guess. It requires a target, and it requires a defined tolerance. If we don't define these up front, we'll fail. We can't shoot at a green open field and expect to hit a target unless the target is there first and you point to that target. If you do that, then we can actually stay in the game. We can manage any disappointment, and we can create a solution that the customer will enjoy. Without those variables being answered, we will fail. Thank you. This is the end of Section 1.